hang on to your quarters, kids, because this remake of Space Invaders is so authentic, you're going to be looking for the coin slot. Welcome back to the Chromework Studio in beautiful Ottawa, Canada. I'm Andrew Tomek, your technology teacher, here with another great scratch lesson for you. So we got something really good starting this week. We've been up to um, this RPG series for quite a while now. Seven weeks in a row we've been doing this, and I thought it's time to do something fresh. Well, fresh, relatively speaking. What I'm actually going to be doing is revisiting some of the old games that we did right at the height of COVID computer camp way back in uh, March, April, May, June of 2020, if you're watching this after the fact. So um, I was just, I was pretty good at Scratch then, but I feel like I've uh, made some real improvements in this six months of really intensive coding. And um, seeing how much interest there was in my arcade games, I thought I would revisit some of my arcade games and do a really nice job on them and show you the difference. So um, flashing up on the screen here, you can see um, a scene from my original Space Invaders game that I put together way back. I believe it was in April 2020. Um, it's okay, and it's a nice little introductory scratch lesson, but it doesn't really look close enough for my liking to the original Space Invaders game, which you can see right here. And um, so here is the new project that I just finished putting together uh, myself this week. So instead of having Jeffrey help me with this, this time I put this all together by myself. So this is uh, completely an Andrew Tomek project here. And um, you can see side by side that um, that I've actually come to something pretty close to the original game, I think. I'm really proud of this project, and I've built it um, to be really easy to teach and to make a lot of sense to you guys as I build it. It's made for um, um, not quite beginner users, but if you've been at Scratch for a couple of weeks or months um, and you know how most of the blocks work, I don't think you'll have too much trouble following along with what I'm doing here. So, um, this is going to be the first of a multi-part series, and we're going to be working on a couple of different uh, things along the way. Uh, there's quite a few sprites and things, pieces of code here. There's just a lot of detail in making a game like this. Um, so it's going to take us a while to do. One of the things that I'm featuring this game is a text renderer engine. As you can see in my version of the project here, instead of using the default sprite variables, which are fine for what they are, but they don't look very authentic for arcade games, I thought I would show you how to actually render real live text on the screen. And that's what, I've, um, what I'm going to be teaching you sometime in a future part. That will probably be like part three of our lesson. We're just going to use some um, default variables for now, and then we'll substitute some other stuff in. Okay, I've been talking long enough. Let's get coding. Okay, we've got a starter file up here. It's um, As usual, I've given you all the graphics and all the sound effects that you're going to be needing for this particular project. Let's do a quick run through here. I've got my spaceship right here at the bottom. These are all the original Space Invaders graphics, by the way. I've downloaded them from a sprite sheet that I have um, gotten from my Space Invaders website. And um, these are all the original graphics. Um, here's the alien that one of the aliens we're going to be shooting. There's actually a bunch of costumes on this alien, and I'll show you a little later what I've done with them. But it's hard to tell because they're against white here. Most of these um, graphics are white, which is going to make them a little difficult for you to see. I've got an alien bomb graphic here, which is just basically a squiggle. Why don't I use a um, paint bucket tool just to show you what we're talking about here? Yeah, there we go. So that so I just put a purple background on there, and you can see what the paint bucket look what the um, what the bo alien bomb looks like. That's animated over a hunt bunch of different frames here to make it look like it's squiggling around. I'm going to undo that uh, purple right now here. Uh oh. All right. And we also have some black sprites at the bottom here. I've designed these to uh, 
so that when the enemy, when the alien bombs hit a shield, remember we have the shield protecting us in the, the game, um, so they make kind of a weird pattern. You'll probably notice in the original Pac-Man game that um, that when blocks were removed from the shield, it didn't happen in a clear pattern. It was kind of chaotic. And I wanted to kind of simulate that. So I have one of these random graphics coming up and painting itself on top of the shields every time a bullet hits the shields. All right, I've got a simple laser graphic here. I've got the aforementioned shields here. I've got a copy of the spaceship that I'm just gonna use as the how many lives we have left icon. And then I've got the UFO down at the bottom here. I've got a few other little visual things. This is just copied from the original Space Invaders game. It is. Yeah, the um, original point score table, and I am using these exact point scores from uh, in my own version of the game. As I said, I've tried to make it as realistic as possible. Um, and there's also a whole bunch of font files here. They're all different variations of the same font. I actually grabbed the original font from Space Invaders. And again, you can't see them here, so let me just fill them in with a background just so you can see a random letter. So these guys all basically look the same. Let's turn it to a bitmap, maybe. There we go. So um, this is the original font. Well, that letter E is not a really good example, is it? Let me find something that's like a C here, for example. Yeah, so this is what the original Space Invaders font looks like. And um, so we're going to be rendering all of the text um, on the screen, including scores and high scores and stuff, all using this font. Now, because of the way it's set up, we're making clones of these letters, which means that we need a different one of these blocks for every single different kind of score. Otherwise, when we delete the clones, we'll get into trouble. So just for simplicity's sake, every kind of text I have here that changes is basically an identical copy of the same file. And we'll be doing a lot of copy paste of uh, our existing code to get this going. Okay, sorry, lots to, to, uh, to go over here, but let's get started with the coding. We'll start as usual with a green flag. So we are gonna edit our spaceship first, get it moving left and right across the screen, which is fairly simple. We'll also, as usual, start off by initializing some variables as well. So um, this starter file already has all your variables set up for you. So um, no must, no fuss for you guys. Let's go ahead and set some variables. Let's set our lives to three. You can change that around if you prefer a game with more lives. Whoops. And we're going to set three variables here. Level, the initial level of our game. We're starting on level one, of course. And our initial score is going to be zero, of course. Now, there's more variables, but they're all um, related to the individual sprites. So I've packaged them up with the sprites that we're on or with the function that has to use those sprites. So these are the sort of game level variables that we're going to need. All right, so there are a couple of costumes in this guide. There's an explosion costume or two explosion costumes plus the original My Ship. So let's make sure we're wearing the proper costume at the beginning. We'll go switch costume to My Ship. There we go. Now, next we want to set a starting position just in the middle of the screen. Actually, the spot where he is right now is great. So I'm just going to go to my motion box. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. And I'm going to grab this down here. This is already registered where our guy is sitting, which is nicely in the middle of the screen in its proper position. 0x and y of minus 125. That's perfect. We can keep going with that. And then we're going to broadcast a message that's called start round. So let's go to our events menu. Go broadcast. Start round. New message. And we'll call it start round. So that will send a message to all the other sprites telling them to go. The first place it's gonna go is over to the aliens where we're gonna to have to start spawning them right across the width of the screen in kind of an array pattern. We're gonna to get to that in just a minute. Um, so right underneath there, once we get the game running, we can go ahead and um, start doing our movement. So I'm gonna have our movement run in a conditional loop here where it's gonna keep running until we run out of lives. So rather than giving it a command to stop when we run out of lives, I'm just going to tell it, keep repeating this loop until our lives are zero. So let's go repeat until right under here. And this will just form a permanent loop until our lives are equal to zero. So let's go ahead and grab an equal to zero. And we can put our lives variable into there. 
lives are equal to zero. There we go. Now, inside here, we're going to put our movement routine. So just two if statements. So let's go if left arrow key. I'm going to grab the one that says key space here and change it to left arrow. If left arrow key pressed. And we also want to constrain our movement here so that we can't move off the screen. I'll do that in a minute, actually. Let's get this going and then I'll show you um, why we want to do that. So we're just going to change our X value. We're only moving left or right in this game. So we're going to go change X by minus five and that'll get us moving left on the screen. I'm going to duplicate that. Right click and duplicate. Now the second time up, I'm going to change it to a right arrow and change the X by five. Okay, so our character is moving left right across the screen now. The only problem is there's no limits to his movement. I've designed this game to look as close as possible to the arcade game. And uh, the arcade game is taller than it is wide, which means we're only allowed to use part of the scratch screen here. It's an area about this size. Now, um, so we're going to have to limit the movement of these guys so they can't go off the virtual screen we're designing here. So we're going to get right on that in a second. I wanted to show you quickly, though, how I designed this game here to make it very, very close to the original um, to the original Space Invaders project. So I went to um, I found an original screen from the game and basically turned it into a 480 by 360 backdrop. And here it is right here. You can see that this puts a perfect version of it on your screen and this will allow you to get the spacing and stuff all set up properly. You can see that I've sized these guys so that they're exactly right here. And when I place them on the screen, they should line up properly with everything that's in the template here. You can see in my game here that when I move over to this guy that I place this guy at the proper X coordinates as well and resized him properly. He looks basically the same as the original guy. This is how you make a legit game that looks exactly like an old fashioned arcade game. So uh, this is my first time trying to do something with really high fidelity like this and I'm very pleased with the results. Okay, back to our spaceship code again here. So we have to limit the movement. These, this guy continues moving left. The, the edge of the screen here is at minus 125. So what we need to tell him to do is you're allowed to move left unless your X coordinate gets too far to the left. If it goes over minus 125, then it's not go then we're not going to be allowed to move anymore. So let's grab a, so we're so we're actually saying not going to go with the not. We're going to say we are allowed to move if our um, if our left position is greater than minus 125. So let's grab a greater than sign and go minus 125. And let's put our X position there, which is under motion. Here we go, X position at the very, very bottom. So that, so if our current X position is greater than minus 125 and we're moving left, then we're allowed to move left here. Let's grab an AND operator from the green operators blocks. There's my AND. We'll pop that into place here and we'll pop this into place here. Just like that. Okay, so you can see when we test our game out here that that will stop us from moving to the left. I should change that background. Yeah, we get to the very left edge of the screen here and then we can't go any farther than that. Okay, so far so good. Maybe I'll just leave that up on the screen for a while. It's not bothering anyone, is it? Okay, we have to do the same thing except the opposite. So we have to say our X position is less than 125 here. So let's go ahead. I'm just gonna make a duplicate of this and statement. We'll trash this right arrow. I'll call this right arrow. And we'll change this to, oh, we can't change it. So we'll just go, actually, we're just gonna grab a whole new less than sign here from our operators. So we're gonna say, X position is less than 125, positive 125. So if both these things are true, then we're allowed to move. And if they're not, then we're stuck. Okay, let's go ahead and check that out. Green flag, maximize. And we'll move to the right and we're stuck there. Left, we're stuck there. Okay, beautiful. So there's lots more coding to do inside our character. But we're going to move along. I'm going to be jumping back and forth in this project because we're going to try to be trying to 
we're going to try to build a working game as much as possible. Some of these facets that we're going to be programming inside the spaceship aren't really important till later on when we get things like shields working, for example. So because we're not doing those till later, we can skip a lot of that code right now and jump to the exciting part, which is the aliens. So let's go ahead and, and um, code our alien character here. Now our alien has 10 different costumes, or actually more than 10, um, but 10 main costumes. So he's got um, so the first row here, let me show you. So the first row is one kind of alien. So I've got two costumes for this, costume A and costume B. And then I've got a costume called 2A and 2B, and then costume 3A and 3B. Notice that 2A and 3A both look the same. I still wanted to create separate costume for them so that I could use a loop to go around and say, this row is costume one, this row is costume two, this row is costume three, like that. So I made copies of these two rows of guys just so that I could name them properly. Okay, let's, so let's start coding the alien right now. I'm gonna start as always with a green flag. And let's go ahead and set some initial variables. The first thing I want to do is point in direction. Let's go to our motion blocks, tell it to point in direction 90. So they're going to be moving to the right at first, which is direction 90 here. Um, one note, I did lock the direction here underneath by clicking on this. By default, our characters are set to spin all around, which we don't want happening with our alien. We don't want them able to flip upside down when they turn left. So we can fix that no matter what angle we're at here, you see we can just lock this and it will set these guys up to no matter what angle I tell them to go to, they will always be facing up down as compared to when this is set, when they can go at weird angles. So this will stop them from flipping upside down. You can do that in the code, but if there's a situation like this where it's not gonna change during the course of the game, you don't need to use a code block. We can just set in our default characteristics for that particular sprite. Okay, let's set some variables here. First variable is called isClone. So let's go is, we'll set is clone to zero. That's a variable that'll let us know whether we're playing with the clone or with the original guy. Scratch needs to know the difference because if, um, if we have a command to make the clones move, um, that will not make the master guy move inside a when I started the clone block, but if we have some commands, but clones, you can also talk to them using a when I receive message block. And when I do that, it's actually talking to both kinds of sprites, the original and the clone, and that can cause some confusing situations. So to avoid that, I'm um, gonna make sure to set this variable so that the original guy's gonna have zero, and then we're gonna have all the new guys have their is clone variable be at one. And that's how it'll tell the difference. Now this is a local variable, very, very important. So when I went to make the variable, instead of clicking all sprites, I clicked for this sprite only. That's very, very important when you're making um, sprites like that that have to do with clones because we want to have a different version of the variable for each clone, like hit points, for example. We want each of the clones to have the same hit points. We don't want them all to die at once. And that's what local variables are for. Okay, set delay. This is another error correcting thing. You'll see it working later. Basically when these guys get to the far left or far right of the screen, they detect that they've reached the edge and then they pop, then our aliens pop down on the screen and then they start moving to the right. During that time when they're moving down, they're gonna be still detecting to see whether they're touching the edge, which will mean that as soon as they get to the edge here, they go and crash right down to the bottom. The way to stop that is by telling them, we're gonna tell them that when, while we're delaying, while, while we're going down here and starting to move to the right, we're gonna not be detecting anymore whether we're touching the edge. And that's gonna turn that off for a little bit and that'll stop our guys from crashing to the ground. Just for like, I think I, I, I set the delay for like two seconds or something and um, that will prevent that problem. It'll have the guy, give the guys time once they reach the left side of the screen to start moving to the right so they're no longer touching the edge basically. All right, we're gonna set our enemy count and we're gonna keep count of them as we're going here. So set enemy count to zero and that's just gonna go up every time here. Um, we already have a start round command. No, we don't. So we need to now get the game running here. So we click the green black flag to get started. But we're gonna broadcast a message here called start round. 
Now it's not saved here, so let me just type that in. Start round. So the start round command is going to initialize everything. It'll start making clones. It'll make clones of our aliens. It'll make clones of our shields. And it'll get the text all going on the screen here as well. The score and the credit. Or we don't have the credit here. The uh, lives. It'll just get the whole screen set up. And then once everything's set up, we'll set, issue another command called um, start, start marching. And that will actually start our aliens moving. Okay, so far so good. So now when I receive that start round message, let's get our aliens to, to um, start doing stuff. We're gonna start spawning them now using loops. All right, so we want our spawner to be invisible. So I'm gonna add a little comment here, right click. I'm gonna be commenting this as I go here. And um, this is gonna be our final file. And so I'm just gonna give an instruction here about what is happening in this file. I'm gonna start commenting these files more so that when you guys pick up the working file, you'll know what all this stuff does. So this is gonna be my saved file for part two when I get it going next week. And so I'm gonna say spawn aliens, just so that we know what that file is for. It's good to comment your code and I'd recommend you guys get into it because it might make sense to you right now, but six months from now when you revisit this project, not so much. And so it really helps you figure out what's going on if you kind of summarize what all the blocks of code do. Not every individual block, but each stack of code basically. All right, let's have our guy go to the starting position, which is minus 186. And so if we send our, um, our guy there right now, you'll see that he pops right into the top left position here, pretty close to um, where these original guys are. And we're gonna set them up in a row here. I basically set them up to go in the middle of the screen here, and that number will get them there at exactly the right height to follow what's happening in this template. All right. Um, now we're gonna set our enemy ID, the enemy ID variable. So let's go to variable set enemy ID and we're going to set that to minus one. Now there's a reason for that. This, this variable is going to determine which costume these guys are wearing. And so what we usually often we're going through a loop and we're changing something like this ID around. We change it by one, but we're changing it by two this time because there's two costumes for each different pose for each different character. So, so the first row, we've got the A and B costume. Second row, we've got uh, A and B costume. Third row, we've got A and B costume as well. So that number, as soon as we get into the loop, we're gonna have it go up by two. So that number is gonna go from minus one to one. It's gonna say wear costume one. And then the next guy is gonna be wearing costume three. So it'll go up by another two every time we go through the loop here. And so that's why we started at minus one, kind of a weird configuration. Okay, so let's go repeat now. Let's go to our variables. We'll go um, repeat, which is under control, sorry. Repeat. So we're gonna be doing five um, rows of guys and each row will have 11 guys in them. So this first loop is gonna be for creating the rows. Inside of this, we're gonna do this five times. And, and every one of them inside there is gonna be another repeat loop that creates 11 guys. So inside here, we're gonna create 11 bad guys and swing around the loop, go down to the next row and um, and do that one 11 times. And this is how you get an array going, basically a, a grid of bad guys. Each one of them a little bit different though. So before we do this repeat though, we're gonna change that variable enemy ID. We're gonna change the enemy ID variable. So right above the repeat loop or in between the two repeat loops, we're gonna change enemy ID to uh, by two. And that'll get it to one, which is the number we want it to be at. Okay, so inside here, we're gonna start creating our rows of enemies. So we're gonna tell them right away to switch costumes to the enemy ID, switch costume to, we can't find enemy ID here. We can only find the individual name of the costume. So that's a variable. Let's go ahead and go to the variable bubbles here and find the one that says enemy ID. There we go, we can put that right into the slot there and let go. So the first guy will switch to costume one, the next row will switch to costume three, et cetera, like that by going up by two each time. Okay, we're gonna set that is clone variable now, set is clone. 
So these new guys, when we create them, which is going to be the next um, command here, they're each going to have that variable of one in them. In them. Okay, let's go ahead and create a clone. Con uh, control, create a clone of myself. So that's going to go ahead and create the clone. Now, um, we won't be able to see these guys because we've already told them to be invisible. Let me put a... Um, let's actually get rid of of that hide here for just a second. I'm gonna put it back later, but I just wanna show you as we're building this, what this is gonna look like. So click the green flag. So we're just creating 55 guys right on top of the same position. So now basically what we have to do here is move these guys over, right? So we they're all appearing in the same spot so now each one has to be separated. Now I figured out um, just by using this template and playing around a little bit that each block is 19 pixels away from the one um, um, beside it. So let's go change our X. So we'll go change our X by 19 pixels. Now this is going to just start drawing across. Let me show you what that looks like. So there we go. We're drawing an endless row of 55 of these guys across. And you see the spacing's pretty good. They're, they're pretty much exactly spaced the way the other guys are. All right. Um, now, uh, we also want to change that enemy count variable here. Let's go to our variables, change enemy count by one. So that'll let us know how many bad guys we still have on the screen. And so we're done with that loop. So what we wanna do now, once we break out of this loop, we've gone around here 11 times and created 11 guys. Before we get back to the top of the loop again, now we wanna do something kind of like a typewriter. We draw across here and then we go chunk right back to the beginning and then go down to the next row basically. So we have to do two different commands here to get them set up to draw the next row before we actually get them drawing. So the first command here is gonna be set X to minus 100 and change our Y by minus 22. Oh, sorry, that goes inside there. There we go. And so every time we come around here, it'll set the X back to minus 100 and then go down 22 pixels to the next row. Let's see what that looks like now. And there we go. We've got a perfect little row of guys, plus our last drawing guy here is gonna be hidden basically. So that's looking really good. We've got a row of guys set up here. I'm gonna put the hide back in here now that we know that this actually works. And we're just, let's just finish off this block of code here. So let's go to our variable, uh, let's go to our control blocks. We'll tell it, before we actually start marching, we're just gonna wait one second. Then we're gonna broadcast start marching. So let's go ahead and broadcast that message. Events, broadcast, start marching. And that'll get our guy moving in. It'll start a whole bunch of other stuff. You'll see a whole bunch of things will all happen when we start marching. We're also gonna set that variable. We've been switching that is clone variable back to zero. And we wanna make sure that our original guy is still at zero. So we're gonna go set is clone to zero. Now I wouldn't normally have coded it this way, but um, when I tested the game, that last guy still continued to move for some reason. He was not, um, he was not um, being frozen because it wasn't recognizing that variable. So I put that variable back and now we're good to go. Okay, in part one here, our basic aim is gonna to be to get these um, aliens marching across the screen and moving across in rows. There's a little bit more that has to be done there. We're gonna head back to our spaceship sprite for a little bit now, because there's actually some code that has to be done there. Before I do that though, I'm gonna get rid of this template backdrop because it's just bothering me a little bit. I just wanted to show you um, that we're staying very close to the original Pac-Man and you can see that this is looking much better now once I get rid of that overlap. Now we've got something that's looking very much like the uh, original uh, Space Invaders game that we all know and love. Okay, let's go back to our code and we'll go to our spaceship. 
So uh, inside the spaceship here, I've coded the original music for Space Invaders. Now there um, wasn't a music file. The music is the problem with using a pre-recorded music file, like a uh, WAV file or whatever. Is that we've actually got um, rather than a constant song, we've just got two beats playing over and over again. I don't know if you guys know the Pac-Man, or sorry, the I keep saying Pac-Man, uh, the um, Space Invaders theme. It's basically just a pulsating sound. Dump, 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 dump. And so um, rather than try and use the original arcade sound, I found a really nice sound inside Scratch here that is uh, replicating that. I've got two sounds here. It's with an electric bass, which basically sounds very, very similar. So uh, I've got the one sound here, the F, and then I've got a D here. So I'm just playing those two notes over and over and over again. And the thing is that the fewer aliens that are on the screen, the faster this music is going to play, basically. So it's going to start off slowly and then go faster and faster and faster the longer we play the game. Okay, so inside our spaceship, is where we're going to be controlling that music. So let's go ahead and we'll do a st when I receive, start marching. So we'll go to our events. When I receive, start marching. Now, have I added a, a broadcast? Yeah, I have right here. Start marching. Just wanted to confirm that. All right. So when I get, so the alien's going to send the message back to the spaceship here to, to say uh, to say that the music should start. It's also sending a message to itself to uh, do the marching, marching motion. Um, all right. Let's go ahead and we'll set our wait time variable. Variables. Set wait time. Whoops. That did something unexpected. Set wait time to one. Okay, that wait time, I'm trying to remember. Okay, that's the initial value of that variable. So it's gonna be going once every second. Dump, dump, dump. But as we play the game, it's gonna change from one and go to a smaller number based on the number of bad guys that we get rid of. Okay. So um, now we're going to keep playing that music until we run out of enemies to attack. So let's go use a control here and we'll repeat until. So we're going to repeat until we run out of enemies. We're going to keep playing that music over and over again. Let's go to our operators and grab an equal sign. And um, we're going to say, where did that equals go? Here it is. We're going to say, Enemy count equals zero. Repeat until enemy count. So let's go here. Enemy count equals zero. Beautiful. Then we're going to broadcast a message that says a switch costume. So let's go to our um, broadcast events broadcast. New message, switch costume. So every time that our aliens get the switch costume message, they're going to go to the next costume. So they'll go from costume one to costume two, and then back to costume one, and then costume two. This is tricky because all every single row has a different ID. Um, and I've got a clever way around that that I'll show you in a second. So we're going to switch costumes, and we're going to play that sound. Let's go to our sounds menu, start sound. F on the electric base, and then we're going to wait. So let's go to our control blocks and we'll wait not one second, but the wait time, what the value of that variable is. It's a number that's going to go down as we play the game. So we're going to wait the wait time. And then we're going to do the same thing all over again. I'm actually going to duplicate all three of these blocks. I'm just going to go duplicate. And so we're going to switch costume. After we wait, we'll switch costume again and then start the sound, but the D on the electric bass this time. And then we'll wait the wait time again. Beautiful. Okay, so that part's done. That's actually the entire contents of that loop. And then we're going to, um, once we're out of this loop and all our bad guys are dealt with, we're going to change our level here. So let's go change level by one and that'll put us onto the second level and let's go stop this script so basically once we're done changing the level 
stop. Now, theoretically, this should stop anyway, but I, I believe I ran into some kind of a bug here where it wasn't always stopping. So just to be sure we we're actually out of this loop and not playing music anymore, I put a stop this script here and it'll stop those sounds from going. Okay, so that's all we had to do inside the spaceship right now. You can, um, actually, we should be able to hear that right now. Let's give it a, a look. I can't hear it because I don't have my headphones on. Let me just have a little listen. There we go. That sounds very authentic. Nice. Okay, beautiful. Now, let us go back to the aliens again. Let's start programming them. Before we program them to start marching, though, let's get that next costume behavior going for them. So they're getting a switch costume message here when I receive switch costume. So let's go to our um, events menu. We'll go when I receive switch costume. Now, here's where we have to do something a little bit tricky, right? We need to have them go from their existing costume to the next costume, then back to the previous costume. We can't say next costume because there's actually a whole bunch of different costumes here that we don't want to be wearing. So I'm going to grab an if else statement here under our control blocks, if else. And I'm going to say if costume name contains the letter A. Okay, so we're gonna need a green block here that says contains. It's actually a text handling variable. Here it is, apple contains A. I'm gonna put that into the if statement here. I'm gonna put a capital A on the right-hand side. And on the left, I'm gonna put costume name. Let's go grab our costume name. It's right at the bottom. It's the one that says costume number, and we can change it to costume name. So we're doing that because all of our First costumes are named A, so 1A, that's our A costume. 2 has an A costume, etc. And then there's a B costume for each one as well. So we're always gonna we're gonna say basically if I'm wearing that first costume, if the name contains an A, then we'll just go next costume and go to the B costume, which is the next one over. But if it's not an A, then it must be a B. Basically, we can make that assumption. And if it's not, then we, we have to go back to the previous costume. How do we do that? Let's go switch costume to, now we want it to be the costume number. Let's go grab that same one that says costume number. So right now he switched to costume B and now we want him to go back one to costume A again. So we're gonna tell him to go to our costume number minus one. Very clever. All right, here is a minus sign, costume number minus one. So it'll go backwards with the costume names and it'll go back and forth like that. Okay, let's have a look at that again. Maximize. Oh, our guys still aren't visible. I re-hid them again. So let me just um, add a show in there. This is not permanent. I don't want you guys to do this. We're just doing this for testing purposes. There we go. And let me maximize the screen here. You can see, yeah, they're going through their animation now. Back from one to the other, one to the other, just like that, beautifully. In time with our music, which is pretty cool. Okay, let's stop that for now. And what else, what else, what else here? Okay, so um, we're gonna get them moving now as well. We don't want this guy moving. I'm gonna leave that show there right now because we um, we don't actually want it in that spot, but um, I just wanna keep showing you what we're doing here. So let's go if, so right under here, uh, after this if else statement, when they change the costume, here's where we're gonna move them. We're just gonna tell them to move five steps in the direction they're going, but only if they're a clone. So here's where we use that is clone variable. If is clone is equal to one. So let's grab an equal sign. And we'll find the bubble for is clone. So if is clone is equal to one, then we're gonna move five steps. In the direction we're moving. 
which is either right or left, depending on what's happening here. So let's have a look at that again. Green flag. And notice that this guy here, the mama, the guy who's making all spawning all the other guys, he's not moving along with his friends now. And that's exactly what we want to have happen. Okay, so these guys are marching along quite nicely. You can see that they don't, they're not respecting our wall boundaries now, and we're going to have to um, slap them around a little bit to get them to change direction. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So um, that's probably the last thing we're going to do today. I think we're probably running out of time here. So let's go grab a when I receive start marching. So we're still inside the aliens here. So this is the command that they're that they're doing every time they switch costume. So I'm just going to give that another comment here. I'm going to say change alien animation and move. There we go. And so that'll explain what we're doing there. I'm going to have to go and comment a few other things. I haven't been doing this routinely. All right. Um, so when I receive start marching, let's go back to that events. When I receive start marching, that means after I finish drawing all my bad guys, we'll go, uh, this will only happen if they're clones. We want this guy to stay invisible. So here's where the show comes in again. I'm gonna get rid of this show from here and we're gonna put it in here. We don't want that master guy to be visible. So we're gonna say, if is clone is equal to one, Grab it equal to, now let's grab the bubble that says is clone. So if is clone is equal to one, then show. And so what that'll do is make everyone visible except for the master guy. He's not moving and he's not visible. He's basically pulling the strings behind the scenes now. Beautiful. All right, so, um, now here's where we're gonna set up the edges of the screen so they turn around. So let's go, we're gonna keep doing this until our enemy count is equal to zero again. Do I have one of those already? Oh, no, it's probably on another on the other sprite. Okay, so let's go repeat until enemy count is equal to zero. We'll go to our control blocks, grab a repeat until block. We'll grab an equal to sign from our operators. And we'll go variables, enemy count is equal to zero. So everything in this loop is going to keep running until we run out of enemies. All right. If, let's grab an if statement here. So here, here's where we're going to start checking to see if our X coordinate has gone outside of that invisible fence that we're trying to set up here. Um, all right. So we're going to say if X position is less than 125. We're going to have to put together some pieces here because there's actually three different things we have to have go on here. Let's just put the pieces together and then we'll drop them in here at the last second. So let's start with X position is less than 125. We'll go to our motion blocks. X position is less than minus 125. And we're going to do the same thing for our X position being greater than positive 125. So those are the two edges of our screen. Let's grab a greater than sign here. If X position is positive, greater than positive 125. And this is where we're gonna set up that delay so that it does so that the guys don't come straight down the screen at us. So we're gonna say if our delay is equal to zero, which means it's the the first time we've detected that we touched the wall, then it's going to bring us down to the next row. But if we've already touched the wall and that delay is equal to one, then it'll ignore that and it won't bring us down or it won't change our direction. Um, okay, so I need a delay is equal to zero. So let's grab one more equal sign. Put a zero. And let's add that delay variable here. Delay is equal to zero. So all three of these, we have to mash them together. So we're basically saying if this or this is true and this is true, then do stuff. Otherwise, ignore it. So we need an and, and an or, or an or and an and, sorry. So we're gonna take the and and we're gonna put the or on the left of it. So it's, if X position or Y position is within the range, 
and our delay is equal to zero. Looks confusing. I'm going to grab this by the word and. If I grab it from anywhere else, it will fall apart. So this is the middle, the core of it, right? And let's pop that into the hole here. So if we're inside the screen and we haven't hit a wall yet, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to change the direction here. So um, let's go to our cha broadcast, change direction. So let's go to our events. We'll broadcast a change direction command. Now the change direction command is what's going to move us reverse our direction and move us down to the next row like a typewriter a little bit right um there's some other stuff in inside this loop that we're going to deal with later that has to do with collision detection and after we're done the entire guys actually you know what this is enough for now so this will um until we can shoot our guys we don't need any more of this code here so we're just going to go back to um our spaceship i believe or no, actually, I think it's inside our alien here. I'm trying to remember where I coded that. So we're looking for something that says change direction. Oh, of course, it would be in the aliens, wouldn't it be? Okay, so here's our change direction script. When I receive, under uh, events, when I receive change direction, we're going to set that delay variable to tell us that we've bumped into this once. And we don't want to bump into it again, not for two seconds anyway. So let's go set delay to one and we're going to start a little timer here so let's go reset timer to bring the timer back to zero so let's go sensing to our sensing blocks and there is a block here that says reset timer you'll see it right here we don't use it very often we use the timer often in video games to time our shooting and to time things like this anytime you want uh, so you can artificially do this with variables. This is actually just a nice canned way to um, to set up timings of stuff. So reset our timing. Our timer goes to zero. And then um, we're going to turn 180 degrees. That'll flip us around. We um, So we'll go turn 180 degrees. We can't say turn right or turn left because when we're moving left, we want to turn right. When we're moving right, we want to turn left. We could do a big complex if statement here saying, if moving left, then turn right, and the opposite for with another an else or something like that. But this is actually far simpler. Just tell them, flip around. Do a 180, dude. All right. Now, here's where we go down. So we're going to change our y here by minus 10. That'll bring us down to the next row. And uh, we're just going to wait a little bit here. And then we're going to flip that variable back to zero again so that it doesn't mess us up the next time we go back. So let's go grab a control block. We're going to go wait until. So we're just going to freeze here until the timer is greater than. I gave it two seconds. It's going to take probably 10 seconds or so for you to get from one end to another. Well, at the end, when you're going a bit faster, that might not be the case, but let's go timer. So wait until timer is greater than two. Whoop, hit the wrong button there. All right, so as soon as our timer goes back to two, up, up above two, then we're gonna flip that variable back again. We're gonna go set delay back to zero again. And that'll set us up for the next row that we're coming across here. All right. Um, I think we can test this again. So let's max our screen out here and have a looky here. So our guys start marching across the screen. And when they get to that far right edge, they should pop down to the next row. There you go. And then start marching again. Let's wait for them to do it one more time. Pew, pew, pew. Can't shoot them yet. We'll have to get to that next week. And down there like that. And then, bang, they come down the next row. And they're just going to keep doing that relentlessly until you are dead or they are. It is a kill or be killed situation, boys and girls. All right. So we've got uh, the beginning of our game going. So next week, we're going to work on shooting. We're going to do our bullets. And we'll do the enemy's bullets. And... Um, then after that, we're going to um, add our shields and we'll set up a new system for that. And 
then we can, um, and I'm not sure how long that's going to take, and then we can start working on um, a whole bunch of little tidbits, text and stuff like that as well for keeping score and all that stuff. I'm going to teach you all about text rendering. That'll probably be mostly in, in week three, and I think this will be a three-week lesson, so that's what I'm shooting for right now. Well, um, this has been a really fun lesson. I hope you guys enjoyed this, and I hope you guys like arcade games. Uh, write me and let me know if you're interested in more arcade games. If you have any suggestions on the game you'd like me to do next, you can email me at info at chromeworks.ca. I'm Mr. T, Mr. Tomek, your technology teacher, and uh, I had great fun teaching you this week, and I hope to see you again next week for part two. Bye now.